All right. So I have no idea what we're doing here. So I want to put that out there first. So <laughs> All right. Great. No. Uh, I mean, actually, what I wanted to do is, you know, I, I mentioned it when we did the podcast about people's view of young people, millennials, and, you know, meeting you guys and talking to y'all and not just y'all. If it was just y'all, that would be just very anecdotal, right? Meeting a lot of young people today that are very focused on uh, improving themselves in ways that aren't just totally selfish. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. You know, and, and things that maybe took me a lot longer than at, you know, at, at your age, I was just getting out of a hospital for alcohol and drug addiction. And then, you know, at the ripe age of 27, mm -hmm. sorry, you know, I can, I can <laughs> that, say 12. Uh, 26. 26. Almost 26. 20, almost 26. Almost 26. Don't give that, don't give that extra month. <laughs> yeah. I don't care when it airs. We'll take it. It was 26. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, in doing it and, and the things that y'all both been through and, and, and have owned in your lives. And, you know, I've got a young guy that works for me, uh, and he, you know, him, my daughter's, my daughter's husband, boyfriend, uh, the other one, and you know, just the way that they see the world, and they're, and they're, it's much better than what I hear people whining about on social media, mm -hmm. right? And and so I was hoping we could kind of just have a talk and and talk about just how we see the world, and 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 maybe that coming to be apparent, um, and then I also look at when people want to complain about people of one generation that are of the generation that raised that generation. <laughs> right. It's right. a little, uh, it, it's, it, it's really kind of pointing the finger at yourself. Like mm. what did we teach them? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, I know both of you have deep faith and your faith is important. Um, and, and I got to tell you for me, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the number one thing. Uh, Olivia, you and I were talking at a group and, and, and you mentioned, as you did when we did the podcast, you mentioned uh, it has to just be a part of you. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I, I said, I'm with you a thousand percent. And it was funny that people at the table were people of faith, but the rest were like, I wish, mm -hmm. I wish. And I get that feeling and, you know, and, and I can't say I'm there all the time, but, but, yeah. but it's such an awesome thing to know that God's with me every step I'm taking. Yeah. yeah. You know, does that where it starts for you guys? Yeah. The fact that he's he's faithful, that he's never abandoned us, that he's always been with us. Like it's it's not easy, you know, like and I mean, um living that like integrated life like with with Jesus isn't easy. You know, I still wake up obviously human every day, you know. So it's yeah. like there's some, some days that like, I'm like, there's more grace to do that than others, you know, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So I, like I was saying before, I, social media, sadly, you know, I, I know a person that says social media doesn't, it doesn't change the way they look at anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's such a dangerous thing to believe. Yeah. Even if you only do it part-time, mm -hmm. if you're on it, it's it's impacting you right sure so so how do I, you know and i'm trying to i said i don't want to just do a conversation i don't know how to do this and not be the interviewer uh <laughs> I, okay so, so bring us into so on that something. on that point of social media and the internet we grew up in a very unique age of like yeah we were exposed to social media and internet at a very young age so we were impacted by things before we had the wisdom to care about how something was impacting us. So I think that does have a lot of effects. Now, we also are exposed to a lot of really amazing information, more exposed to a lot of really good information. But ultimately, you know, internet does have, can have a negative effect on people, but it's not the internet's fault. It's the person's fault for um, allowing themselves to, I guess, enter in that, into that space, you know, like you can use the internet and social media for good things Absolutely. and you can put boundaries on yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to be aware. You have to make sure that you're aware when you're approaching the internet and social media. So how did, how did you of... develop being an aware, being aware of that? Did it start that your parents put limits on your, you know, you just start, my parents were like free, you know, right. you can do whatever you want. All right. So how did you put that on yourself? <laughs> did you start realizing, okay, some of this isn't good for me or 
wow, I don't even want to know if this is real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, every, I think, you know, it wasn't until probably within the past couple of years that I've really put like a conscious limit on certain things. And, you know, one of those things is like, you know, um, every social media platform has an algorithm. And I think we, we kind of understand now because social media has been out for a while, we understand what these companies are doing They're They have an algorithm. The second we look at something for, you know, 10 seconds, it's like, okay, this guy kind of likes this thing. So we're going to put more of this. Mm -hmm. And so I personally, the second I see a picture of, you know, a group of girls in bikinis on social media, I immediately pass by, like not even, not even going to spend any time on it. And that's just a very transparent example of, you know, I'm not going to spend any time feeding anything that might lead me to sin or to think a different way. Like, and it's that way for, you know, you know, like these like fitness influencers that have really bad information. I don't want them, you know, I don't want any of this information on my, on my social media platform. Instead, I feed it with the doctors who I really trust. I listen to their podcasts and things like that. And fitness professionals who I really trust. Second, I see their stuff. I stick on it for a while and I don't mind leaving it on the counter and doing some stuff, staying on it. And so kind of like playing with the algorithm, using it to my advantage. Okay. And to where I'm getting nothing but helpful information, you know? Yeah. You do the same thing. I mean, you I was click never click off the bikini girls right away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of well, we we were raised without that privilege of like having internet or anything, and I, I called it a privilege. I don't know. I think it, it was probably like a blessing too, you know. So I mean, well, while we had internet, we didn't have like. I had a MySpace behind my parents' back, you know. And then, Olivia, like, either, oh, come, come on! on. Oh, you just ruined my image of you. <laughs> yeah, and they got grounded when they found out, you know. Oh, nice. But um, then Facebook too. Like I went most of high school without that, you know, just because, like, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see the need. Like I had, I had the people in my life that, like, I wanted them there, you know, and. Um, felt like I could express myself well, just being involved in a lot of things. So it was kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of different than, I have a different perspective than Reed, but um, I do see beauty in the internet. And um, especially having been a youth director for a year and a half, um, I would tell my youth all the time because they're engulfed, like probably even more so than we were growing up. Like they are yeah. in golf. Like that's all they've ever known. They've had phones since they were four. You know, like it's always been at their fingertips. You know, it's funny though. You, you say that when I'm, I've got four kids, right? Mm-hmm. Two in their twenties mm-hmm. and ten and a six-year-old. Yeah. So two older girls, younger boys, same wife, same marriage. But you know, it's when when the girls were young the access to my space, mm-hmm. you know, all that mm-hmm. was just getting started. And there were, there were actually less controls mm-hmm. over things than, than there are now. Now there's also now even more opportunity to get whatever, wherever you want or whatever you want. Right. But there's more opportunities to have controls as a parent. And even within the systems, you know, so like games back then, if you played an online game with other people, you didn't get to invite somebody in you never played with your friend down the road Mm -hmm. you you don't know who you're playing with right right but today you can set it up like my 10 year old son he plays a couple of games that he does with other people and uh i don't want to give anybody any of them uh, advertising but um but you know and and they'll they'll do that and somebody will join in and as a group they'll decide to let them in and if that person seems to be behaving odd or whatever they boot them Mm. right and so there's a socializing that's going on there that for me happened running around the neighborhood yeah. places you can't let yeah. your kids you know you can't just let your kids go out in the neighborhood and go run out the sugar cane fields anymore things like that things we did when you know back in the olden days <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know yeah. and uh in doing that but but i do see that there's an opportunity and they and they do it and they'll let my younger son he'll get on when it's just them and and play and it's funny because man there's times he's leading the crew, like, you know, and, and, and I, I see leadership skills developing. I see communication skills developing. Don't get me wrong. 
they also yell and whine sometimes and do that. They're not, you know, it's, it's not like I think this is the edge of the, where education needs to go and be like yeah. this, right? Yeah. But I do see some of those things developing. I think I think that's good. Yeah. Um, what I was going to, it was like, I was a youth director for a year and a half and I would tell the youth all the time, like, I one thing, one attribute, I guess, that I saw in all of them was that they were truth seekers. Like they have, like this generation wants to know the truth. Right. Yeah. And like, it's true. maybe it's hard <laughs> for them to receive, but they want to hear it, you know, and right. maybe they won't receive it right away, but they want to know it, you know, so that they can accept it for themselves. And so there's beauty in the fact that like this access is so close to them to find out what's true, you right. know? Um, and like, yeah, the internet has been like so beneficial for me in that way too. Like, in uh, right at the, I guess, my first semester of college, I dated a Muslim guy. And I wasn't, I, at that point, I, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. You know, I was kind of just, I had this encounter with him. Um, but it was through that relationship, he'd ask me all the time, like, like, simple things about my faith that I should know. And so it was like, what does amen mean? Why do you say that? What is like, like, tell me this, tell me that, like, why is Mary, like, immaculate, can, why do you think, what do you think about Mary, like, why was she immaculately con conceived, or whatever, um, and so I go on the internet, and look up all of these things, you know, and find them for myself, and it was through those, like, conversations that, like, I really started to own my faith at that point for myself, you know, right, right. to the point where finally I found the creed and I sent it to him and I was like, this is everything we believe, like, <laughs> you know? Here's the next show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I really, I have a lot of respect for this generation because they, they really are, they, they want to improve themselves. They want the truth, you know, like, the mental health culture is like so healthy right now. People are people are really diving into their mental health, their physical health, their like spiritual health in these ways because it's so accessible. You know, it's funny looking at the generations too. You, you talk about the millennials and right now millennials are like from 36 to 24 or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, in that in that range. Um, the older ones, I think, were more in that adjustment though in a time period from when social media was you know came in they were a little older and, and i think that that there was um and 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 i don't want to put anything on a generation or even a part of a generation in, in that but um but mental health in in those late 90s early 2000s and 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 it's still a problem it's always been a problem it's still a problem but it but it the reason it's come to a forefront is because it was such it became so much worse mm -hmm. and there were people with 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 everything that basically had nothing because they couldn't cope they couldn't deal yeah. they can't and and they're out there today and, and and anybody that needs help i hope they get it because um you know i've known people that have committed suicide and 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 you know by extension mm -hmm. family members who've known people you know in that and uh and, and doing it and and i do think it's a good idea to uh, get that checkup right yeah. like what right, right, you know we all got a mind mm -hmm. and all our minds are susceptible to a bunch of garbage mm -hmm. and they're eating and everything. And so I, I look at it and say, you know, just somebody goes see Reed to get a check, you know, get their self in physical shape or whatever. Um, and look, not everybody has to go to a psychiatrist. Not everybody even has to go to a psychologist, mm -hmm. but maybe a life coach, maybe a, just somebody that helps you check yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's a huge I hear people question like the life coaches mm -hmm. the more i've studied and know about them and, and and i got certified to be a coach and and doing all that it's like okay this just makes sense yeah. Yeah. it's not about them telling you what to do it's mm -hmm. about them helping you see the obstacles in your life and, yeah. and have and live a better life mm -hmm. right and you set the pace mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's and, sorry uh yeah it's i mean it's completely like in order to handle anything well, we have to be aware of what our values are, what our priorities are. And, and the same thing goes for the internet, just to bring that back out, you know, there, you know, the devil can use anything to, to deceive us. And the internet's one of those things. So we have to be aware of what we're, we're getting ourselves into. We have to be aware of what boundaries we need to be setting on, on things and like what content we want to consume. Ultimately, it is our choice to consume, you know, certain things. 
Um, so, I mean, you know, having a life coach is, I think, something that really everyone should do, you know, because the way they approach it is very action oriented. Mm-hmm. I've, I've come across uh, therapists who, you know, aren't super action oriented. They help me uh, maybe become aware of a certain issue. Um, but, you know, I've also met people who have been in, in counseling for six years and I've never seen them take action on anything. And, and the thing about a life coach is they're very much so like, take you know kind of a holistic whole approach to you know mental health like hey we're going to change your whole mindset and we're going to make sure that we're taking action on a daily yeah, basis I, I, I overall agree with what you're saying i want to make a stipulation in there though there are people that need the mental health 100%. professional yeah. mm-hmm. they, they need the counselor or they need the professional psychologist and they need that there's nothing wrong not with a replacement. that's what they need it's a life not, coach is not a replacement. But, 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 <laughs> well, but, but I agree. You're right, too. They have a purpose, though, and it's it's to deal with more of those, you know, uh, man, I get in trouble for using certain terms, but, um, you know, the uh, it's not necessarily mental illness, but those mental issues that are going on where a life coach is helping the regular person just set those set those goals, see obstacles. And you had said it about what thing can I do versus what I can't do? Mm-hmm. Helping the person look at themselves and go, well, look, that's not even, I'm spending so much time on this and I can't control it anyway. Yeah. Let me go work on what I can. I think life coaches help do that. Yeah. I lot. think, I think uh, it's a, it's a, like, you need, you need both for sure. Be, and, and mental, like, you don't even need like a mental illness or a diagnosis to see a therapist or a counselor because like we We are all we've all been (laughs) so wounded you know and we all walk as you know just broken vessels and and like praise god that he uses us and but he also uses those 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 mental health professionals to help us identify those roots and become more whole and then the and then there's the life coach and then there are spiritual direction directors, you know, good ones that like bring all of those back. You know, it's a circle. You know, it has to be like it's a, it's it's everything. You know, like all of it is so necessary. Like we have to know ourselves um, from the womb. You know, like yeah. from 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 the inside out. And so it's like working on yourself in like body, mind, soul, like just always, you know, uh, trying to be completely integrated, you know, a, an integrated human is like what more integrated people is what this world needs. Like people who are like shameless in seeing, in seeking professional help, um, shameless in like, um, like getting a life coach if that's what they need. Uh, good spiritual direction is so needed and good spiritual directors are so needed you know, um, and because it's all about like, God wants us completely free. I think it's a balance to the, you know, and, and back to the generational thing where, you know, when I was young, you were brought up to, to put that stuff aside mm-hmm. and just focus on being successful. Mm-hmm. Right. In the eighties, it was about go, 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 live rich, mm-hmm. you know, meaningful, met big house, everything, you know, and, and I get it. It still does to some people. And, and, you know, but that was the, that was what it was all about. And and you push that, and you, there just, there wasn't a lot of ways to deal with it. Now, that's at the same time that some of this started to actually develop uh, and, and, and go. And, and it's funny though, because I agree with you that we need it, but it's this balance of, we also do need to be like, we can't, I know a lot of people that, that they're in their forties, fifties, maybe even older, that still blame the way their parents raised them for all the problems in their life. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, at some point, we need to use that to be able to take control of, again, back to the things we can control, things we can have have an impact on. And it can't become this excuse of the world's, see what the world's done to me. No, it needs to be a let me free myself from that. We can, so go, I can go we can go our whole lives blaming a whole lot of people and god for all of our issues but until we take ownership of the fact that like we're broken and need healing and we have a healer like we're not going to get anywhere and we're going to be drinking that poison you know and and just making ourselves miserable because you're you're in shackles to those excuses yeah, you're you're 100%. being held back by all of those 
you know, all of those reasons why you're not successful or you're not doing what you need to be yeah. doing or why you're sad all the time. It's like you're being held back. You're letting yourself be chained up. Whereas, you know, you, you have to you have to experience freedom mm. in order to have right. any success. We have yeah. to feel free. And, and, and even to have success and failure. Right. Yeah. It oh, doesn't absolutely. mean you yeah. can you can be in the greatest mental mindset. You can have the greatest spiritual life, you know, and you can go try to do something and it just flops mm -hmm. or you decide, man, this is the perfect time to sell these things. Right. A, 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 a mouse for a computer. And all of a sudden somebody comes out with a chip or a little thing that just goes in your hand that works so well. And, and you've just spent, you know, $3 million on these new mouse, mice, mouses, whatever they're called, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and doing it. And it doesn't mean it was a horrible idea. It just, that, that's the way it rolls sometimes. And it's, but it's then being able to go, you know, look at it objectively. Yeah, I made a mistake. Yes, I lost everything maybe financially. Yeah. How do I step forward? What's, how do I take the next step forward? And let's keep step that to me, that's where success is. Yeah. Because we're going to hit, you know, yeah. I'm just by sheer time, I probably hit more hurdles than y'all. I'm not saying they've been bigger than the ones y'all hit, but I probably hit more of them, you know, and it, you, we're going to continue to hit them. We're always going to hit hurdles, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I love uh, one of my, one of my favorite talks that I've ever experienced was kind of in the beginning of my conversion. There was a Benedictine monk that came to, to the college and gave a talk and he started off the talk with you will fail <laughs> you are going to fail you're going to fail again and then you're gonna die <laughs> and i loved it i Motivation. mean there was, there was so much <laughs> there was so much freedom in that right uh right. mindset because it's right. like there's no more pressure i mean you are going right. to fail right. Right. you have to accept that as a part of life but that doesn't mean you should lose your peace over this mm. you know right. Right. um we we should you know it's very buddhist sounding by the way yeah <laughs> uh we need to be able to accept those failures as that's just a part of the daily basis you know yeah. it might be inconvenient but like you said okay it's inconvenient i'm stressed out let's make a list what can i do now yeah. you know there's there's no point dwelling on it there's no point in really sitting with it you can evaluate it mm -hmm. and then say all right what can i do now that's that will lead me in the right direction yeah mm -hmm. so what do you see like i see a lot of young people involved in their faith right now mm -hmm. um and and i think that you know one of the reasons that a lot of other people don't see it is because well they're not necessarily involved with the people in their faith not that they don't have faith not that they don't have their own faith but they're not necessarily involved with their church or with their or with their high schools or with their whatever to see it mm -hmm. you know they're just reading the bad news that happens and we're all susceptible to that but what do you see young people doing that is you know that that gives you faith in your generation i think it's easy for us because we're in a young adult community in lafayette louisiana yeah. and it's on fire right now <laughs> i mean it's it's uh quite beautiful to be a part of it mm -hmm. i mean um for the people who might be listening to this podcast that you know uh struggle with having hope for like future generations come to lafayette louisiana yeah, and yeah, watch us worship on. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, um it, it's been <laughs> great to just uh to just be a part of this community over here and and like you said i mean we're surrounded by people who are just like on fire for christ like and is that based right. out of a certain place or is that just just no. friends that have just developed it's pretty it's pretty spread out we we it's like everyone found each other mm -hmm. in lafayette for the most part you know lafayette's kind of like a hub for a lot of surrounding cities mm -hmm. and very catholic area one guy's vision alex alex frederick and uh he yeah. started off with a pretty small group and it's uh, what is it like closer to 70 or 80 people now that are involved just yeah. over the course of two years yeah. um and it's and it's young adults living out their faith in their life and we're all at different places we're all at different levels but we can come together and either talk about secular things or jesus and it all be okay you know and it's, like, and it's all good because yeah. it's all part of our life yeah yeah right. and i mean yeah. these social events events a lot of the times there's no music and it's just conversation for two hours about, you know, different things. And you'll just walk through, if you just like walk through all these conversations, you'll hear people talking about Jesus left and right, left and right. And you'll hear people talking about their jobs and what they do. Everyone's introducing and, each and other. And, and, and um, yeah, it's, it's really cool to see. It's I mean, it's blessing. unique. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, when I was, uh, when I first got sober, at, you know, uh, back in 88, and the next year, we started a group called Young Drunks in Lafayette, mm -hmm. and there have apparently <laughs> been a couple of Young Drunks groups since then, and, uh, but it started off, we had, I don't know, 10 or 12 people meeting at, at I was roommates with a couple of other guys that uh, were in the program, and, and it started off, with, I don't know, 10 or 12 people, we'd get over there, and then the next thing you know, there's like 50 people showing up a couple of times a week at our place. And and, and then there was just impromptu. Like yeah. if they didn't know where to go, they came there. If they didn't feel safe on their own, yeah. they came there. Right. And 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 so, you know, in the big book, it talks about, you know, fellowship will grow up, grow around you. And uh, and that's the Alcoholics Now Speak book, not the Bible. But 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 it doesn't say that those words in the Bible. But it, but I, but it's the same thing I think with spiritual life. It's no, it's exactly the same thing because that's what it was. What you were talking about is when we we would get together, we'd have a meeting, but we'd also just hang out and be there. And and we ended up uh, renting a room at at, at UL, well, USL then UL, and uh, and and we'd have a you know we'd get we'd get uh, we'd fill this this space. I don't know I don't remember how many people could fit mm -hmm. in there, but maybe sixty people sometimes. So, you know, usually about twenty or thirty, and. And it was the same thing. We were talking about everything, and we would hang out and, and just and just be together. And it was, you know, I remember that. Like when y'all talking about that, I remember that so fondly of being in that position with those people and uh, and doing it. And it and we were on fire. And we were very. Uh, there were people of different, I guess, faith, whatever. Um, and and you know, it wasn't like all Catholic or all this or all that or whatever. But uh, but everybody believed in God. And, and, and it was some of the most spiritual AA meetings you've ever been to, yeah. you know, yeah. where, where a lot of them sometimes go into other areas, which, hey, those people getting sober and, and, and they're also, a lot of them are finding God through those meetings. So it's a wonderful thing. Um, but those meetings were extremely spiritual. And, and some of the old timers, you know, like people my age now uh, would come and they would like it there because they would get more of that. They would feel God mm -hmm. in the meeting in a way that they didn't necessarily for them feel it in other places yeah. you know to to be part of that youth and that fire so man i think that's freaking awesome y'all are doing that you yeah. know that that's happening yeah and i mean people seek the truth you know people will always seek the truth um and yeah and they're going to find that truth in god you know especially mm -hmm. the people who who allow themselves to see it like they're naturally we're all going to have that desire right and as if we allow that desire to take charge of our actions and we feed that desire, mm -hmm. then we'll find God and we'll be satisfied. <laughs> I think um, maybe bringing it back to like the uh, social media aspect, like the reason why social media it can, can be so beautiful is because it's so easy to find motivation on it. You know, like there are so sure. many other young people, even if you don't have them in your immediate circle, like, I mean, I know so many girls who have been so affected by Sadie Robinson, you know, and just her faith witness or, you know, just like those those people that they can really look up to, that they can see that are living for more than what this world offers, you know, and for and that are seeking, you know. Right. And so, yeah, you can find really ugly things on sure. the Internet, but there are so much like there's so much good and it's not hard to find that good. And so I think that's one of the most beautiful things about like this generation is that like they're truth seekers and the truth isn't hard to find, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I see on social media a lot, you know, like I saw somebody, you know, said, uh, you know, I hope one day you get to live the, the life you post on the internet, on, on mm -hmm. Facebook. Right. You know, and it kind of thing that, that just as a general deal that most people put their best look out there, but when we're, when we're open, honest and vulnerable, to me, that's that's when we give the opportunity for others to be able to grow through witness, witnessing us and, and doing that and ourselves yeah. by being yeah. honest, you know? Yeah, yeah. we're, um, I mean, we have a lot of options now, like with everything, everything mm -hmm. in life and the internet is probably the main driver of that we, we have unlimited options for everything we have to choose for. And that causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of having to constantly think about things way more than we, we really should have to. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to be aware of that and for parents to, to make their kids aware of that when they're introducing them to the internet. Cause look, you got to introduce them to the internet. It's going to stay around forever. They're going to have to. And, and I would, 
I think that it's really important for kids and parents to to make it really clear that this this access to unlimited information mm -hmm. causes some anxiety mm -hmm. and it's important to uh set time boundaries on it to you know make sure that you have time to see what's around you because it's also kind of hard to stay present when you're on the internet yeah right, right? it's easier to to kind of zone out so having those time limits as well, we talked a lot about the boundaries that you set on social media and stuff like that, but also the time limits, I think is really necessary to make sure you're experiencing life and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I know several kids in high school and I think in high school, it's, it's how do you, how'd you get from, and I don't know, I'm going back in the interview guy, but how, how'd you get from, you know, that high school world into young adult, and because to me, that's the hardest transition, right? That's for, for, for most people, because I, I think the support systems in high school aren't as developed, the, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. I mean, what, what is somebody, a parent that has a 16, 17 year old, you know, can they do anything or they just need to pray a lot and try to be a good example? <laughs> do you have any advice on that? <laughs> I know you haven't been a prayer, 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 a, prayer, prayer a lot. Prayer, yeah. prayer a lot for sure. My 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 parents would always tell me in high school, like this isn't it. Like you might not ever see these people again. Like don't settle for like this small world. Like there's more out there, you know. Right. Um, and so it was it was just like that constant like hearing that like this isn't it you know like there's more you're going to meet people in college that are more like you and blah 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 and i did you know and um and maybe that was a result of my parents prayers you know because there were a lot of just really divine encounters i could have gone one way for sure i had so many opportunities to be like a, a different person you know but there was just a grace i don't know um there was like a desire to like live for more you yeah. know just um to do good and make beauty in this world yeah so. i think um at the end of the day you know all parents should of course be striving to live like christ and if mm -hmm. uh if the child sees that they are going to desire that joy yeah right. if we're if we're truly striving to live like christ we are going to be joyful other people are going to see that joy and want to be joyful as well and i mean you know so i, I my parents did a great job of of being very loving they you mm -hmm. know they weren't they weren't catholics they weren't christian they just kind of were spiritual people and just honestly they just loved well mm -hmm. and you know they both loved me very well and i went to college kind of just with a, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes in early college and I, I partied a lot and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, I, I don't feel like I ever truly lost myself, whereas mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of my friends completely lose themselves. Yeah. And I lost myself. I was yeah. that guy for sure. It's, it's having a plate. It's having like a root, you know, like yeah. I think a yeah. lot of people aren't rooted in something. And so like you can be rooted in your family and that's a good place, you know, and right, like right. hopefully God is present there, you know, but like there it's it's having somewhere to go back to that's safe. And it's not just like being lost in this world, you know, and right, like right. so many people like graduate high school without like a foundation of some sort, like a strong foundation. And so I think like parents their main responsibilities to establish that like how do you want your kids to like enter into this world as adults you know like what foundation are you setting for them like you yourself are setting that foundation you know so like where is it laid how thick is it laid you know and um like i mean also just like maybe limiting who who they spend time with you have like an instinct as parents i i like hated my mom and dad for some sometimes for not letting me like go on the sleepover or like hang out with these people you know but like now in hindsight i'm like oh yeah like that i was probably <laughs> that was a good choice. might have been a good call you know yeah. like that it was a good call i can relate yeah, you know absolutely. and so it's like it's okay to not be your kid's friend you know <laughs> and like and like just have wow. that as like that foundation of love that like they can go back to and like just kind of like um like the truth is hard to receive well like like for this like anybody like sometimes it's hard to hear the truth but they need it and so it's it's the same way and i think like 
parents can like tell your kids the truth and do what's best for them and accept that like as a teenager they can be pretty ruthless you know yeah, I know yeah. I was I'm like gave my parents like a lot of trouble you know but um at the end of the day they're gonna go back to that you know and like uh like accept that as love yeah I, I, I love the roots comment you know and and look I I, I did things that were undeserving of the way my parents raised me. So mm -hmm. it's not their fault, you know? Yeah. Um, it'd be easy to, I guess, you know, some people have, or it would be easy to sit back and go, well, that's why I was where I was, whatever. But I don't think I would ever come to um, a true resolution to any of that if I'd have stayed in that and, and knowing that. And so I have to also look at the same thing, raising my own kids and, and say that, you know, there's so much we can do, mm -hmm. but there's so much... We talk about the internet. Okay, you're not just worried about the kids at the sleepover mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You're worried about the information they're they're finding and getting bombarded. And yes, there are good things. There are also very bad things, yeah. and especially at an age when you're most likely to be, you know, impacted by that or or, or formed by that. And and you know, my my kids, my older daughters, um, one has a one has a relationship with Christ. I say that you know. Uh, she believes and, and the other does it, but their actions, you talked about having loving parents, you know, um, their actions of loving others. I, I, it's hard for me to point to two better examples that I know. Yeah. Right. And in uh, the way they treat their friends and the people around them and, and strangers that they run into, you know, it's just, it's, it's, and, and look, when I was that age, my faith was, you know, you know, by the time I was 25, 26, I, I had faith. I knew there was a God. He had, mm. he had already done things for me that I couldn't have done for myself. But, you know, I, di I didn't want to put him in a religion. Mm -hmm. I had too many questions. I had all that stuff going on. And um, we didn't get married in the church to start with. We 10 years later, we got our marriage blessed. Was that mostly your um, decision? It yeah. was. Uh, or like, were you, yeah. were you hesitant to get yes. involved with so, religion? So we went, we went. In Lake Charles, we went to the church there and we talked to the priest and we, we were getting set up. We had to go do an interview with him and we're talking to him. And he said, you know, in doing this and doing your vows, you're promising that you're going to raise your family in the, in the, in the Catholic church and you're going to raise your kids to be and all this and everything else. And I walked back, walked out and went, can't do it. Mm -hmm. And my wife said, what? I said, I can't, I can't be honest about one part of the vow and knowingly not be a hundred percent on another part because then it just right, it, right. It, none of it's good in yeah. my mind. And uh and one of the harder things I ever did was she said, Well, you're gonna tell my parents. Oh she understood. <laughs> she yeah. understood. Oh right? yeah. Right. I love so, her. So right. <laughs> so, so you know what? I think it I think it's one of the best things. It, it was one of the toughest things to do, but it was also one of the things that let them know. And even for us, I think in a way that I'm ready to be a man and 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 live my life the way I'm that I see is is the best yeah. way to do it. And now it was a justice of peace, but she said a beautiful. She asked if we had faith. We, said, we told her about our faith. She said a beautiful prayer. Ask God to be with us, and, and you know, and I believe He was, and I and and I know He was, and I know that the journey back to my faith, it was necessary to happen that way for me. Mm -hmm. right and so while i want my kids i want to grab them and 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 they pulled away from the church or whatever and i want to put them in the pe i know that's like exactly the wrong thing to do yeah you know yeah. right but but, but to be part of that and then when we got our wedding blessed we went to see the the deacon at the church we were at in florida and he says he's like okay well uh he goes well when do y'all want to do this and we're like well what's you know kind of what's the calendar or whatever and he goes well just whenever you want. When you do it like on Tuesday night, you just come into the, come, my wife and I'm like, no, 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 we need to do this in the church. And they had a little chapel too. Because well, we don't usually do that in the in the church. And so, you gotta understand, her mama and my mama have been waiting for this for a long time to happen in the church. People are coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it may not be, we don't necessarily need, you know, hundreds of people, but the family itself is coming. And so we ended up doing a, a little more than they normally do for just a blessing. But so at what point did you start striving to live like Christ? Was it when you converted or was it like kind of a was there a point where you just like Man, that's a fell in love with Jesus? Okay. 
it was when when I was in, I was I went into the hospital at the end of my addiction, <clears throat> and I and look I still consider myself alcoholic addict. I think you are for life. At the end of my desire to to be in that life, I was put in a, I was in the hospital. I passed out at my parents' home, and I brought me to the hospital. Um, I was threatening to take. I, I didn't know this until my dad told me just a, a little while before he died that I had told them that the next day. I was planning on killing myself by taking a bunch of acid and doing all these things. And uh, and I had been trying to do it for weeks already and it just wasn't working. And um, and so they brought me to the, I passed out, they brought me to the hospital. I don't know when it was, it was days later. Um, I was in a room, and it's the first conscious thought I had and I was looking out and I saw this whiskey bill, billboard and I and I immediately started to shiver and, and, and was in so much fear that if they let me out, I'm dead. Wow. And then right after that, all of a sudden I was calm and I felt a warmth. Uh, Olivia, when you and I talked <clears throat> on your podcast, we talked about emptying the vessel. Mm. It, that's what happened. The vessel was empty and because I had nothing, I had nothing. And, I, and the thought that came to me was, just do what they put in front of you to be all right. I didn't know who they was. I didn't know anything about that. Um, the, then somebody knocked on the door and they brought me down to this group meeting and I introduced myself to everybody. Well, apparently I had been to this group meeting before, but I didn't remember being. <laughs> oh, wow. And I had been, I was not lucid though when they brought me. I talked gibberish or I didn't talk at all. I would talk out of turn. And uh, in this day, I remembered the day before I came into the hospital. I remember, I remember things clearly. And I, since then, I haven't had a desire to drink or do drugs. Wow. It was removed from me. Praise you God. know, I had a life to live. So I did what they put in front of me and, and, and what they taught me in AA was to be of service to others, right? to help others to do that. And so I had a desire to live like Christ. I just didn't know that's, I just didn't have his name attached to it. Yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, that's what I'm saying. The question is kind of, um, and then so as time went on, even when my faith began, we we were in we moved to Florida and we had we were looking at um, wanting to looking at at what we were going to we needed to make a decision with our faith. What were we doing? And uh, and I met this couple and we went out with them one time. They were not our people. We weren't their people, but they gave me a book, "Rome Sweet Home" by Scott Hahn. Oh, yeah. hmm. And he answered all the I questions. He answered all the questions that I had been having really? in a way, a Protestant preacher that used to try to get Catholics to convert to being Protestants, right? To has become a Catholic. And he's, he walked into the mass and saw revelations come into to life before his eyes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and you gotta be a real Bible thumper to be able to see that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and doing that. And so, and the things, and, and then there were things that I still had questions, but that's when I decided it was okay to, to suspend my doubt on those and focus on the question that God's putting in front of me and answer that to its fullest, then move on. Mm -hmm. Instead of letting the fact that I have more questions make me not participate. Yeah. It, it was okay. And, and, and really, I began to have, I got involved with KCs. I got involved with a couple of different things. And, and, and I still had an involvement for service. Um, when I went on my axe retreat, I, I think is one of the places I could markedly say my relationship with Christ himself really got to be more by name, right? Even though I think that's, I, I was, you know, and I'm still a big Holy Spirit guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I talk to the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't use Jesus' name that much. I, I talk to the Holy Spirit all the time, I'm a big Holy Spirit guy. And, and I even philosophically have, have justified why that, you know, that's what everybody should do. But uh, <laughs> uh, be like me. Uh, <laughs> you know, he said he was going to give us the Holy Spirit to deal with. So, no, no, but, you know, but, but, and doing it, and I do it, you know, in my story, in my life, the way we found our home here. I mean, there's so many things where I look at it and just see God's hand moving us. And, and some of those, you know, and, and he hadn't made me a rich man. He hadn't done that. He hadn't done, he hadn't done the things that I dreamed of what success looked like. Um, but he's put, he's put a community around me of people that love me that, that y'all were talking about the young people, man, being able to do that, you know, with, with 
people my age and stuff that that community's developed too uh, is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. So, that answer your question more than so. It does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. So, I'm satisfied. Uh, yeah. So and then and now he's kind of it's it's uh it's just what we're going to do today mm. you know it's just what are we going to do today and, let, and let's see what's going to happen next and, yeah. and let's move forward yeah. Yeah. yeah well your testimony is like a beautiful example of what we were talking about before like parents just need to trust that what they're doing is enough and i mean as long as they're doing all that they can do you know for their right. their their kids and their teens like because i mean eventually you just have to let them go and and like trust that they're going to find their way back you know and, yeah. and that they're going to have that encounter with jesus it happens for everyone so differently you know yeah part of loving is is trusting and, mm -hmm. and allowing that freedom for the for another person to make their own decisions and just trusting that they're going to make the right decision now mm -hmm. it's you know definitely as far as parenting I have no place to talk, but <laughs> it is, it is like, it should be a universal uh, or an objective truth that if you strive to live like Jesus, then uh, there will be ripple effects. Mm -hmm. there, there will be, but the reality too, is that that kid has free will when they become an adult yeah. and, and man, boy, there's times I can, I can speak as a parent. There's times you want to, you know, go, really, could we not give this one any more free will? Right. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and, and do it, but, but no, but it's the beauty of it. And it's also the thing that makes you go when you see that person do something that is, you know, my, my, my youngest daughter had to miss coming to the house for, uh, uh, for a dinner one night. Um, and later in the next night, I missed going to their place for a dinner. There, it was a birthday thing going on. And well, I went, but then I had to leave because I got called to go. This guy needed some help and uh, with this and his family. Um, anyway, they were down on their luck. So I, I, I got to go. And I, I went to help him. And I was apologizing. And she's like, Dad, you know why I didn't, wasn't there last night? Because a friend called me during the day. And it was just on my heart that I needed to go be with them instead of, she goes, I wanted to be with y'all, but instead of doing that, I needed to be with her. Mm. And, uh, and, and it's like, okay, if they were just perfect all the time, an event like that would almost go unnoticed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. But, 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 but the reality is, is they got, everybody has to go deal with life. You guys got to do it. We got to, got to go deal with life. You got to deal with the messiness. So when you see somebody step up when you see somebody step forward in their faith, like I see you guys doing, it gets you excited. Yeah. You know? Um, and, you know, I hope it gets y'all excited that an old guy is interested in, in, in <laughs> the fact that we're where y'all are. Yeah. Right. That, that, that that's maybe a little different. I don't know. Um, you know, how most, how you're seen and treated by, by, you know, by people that are older, everybody in their twenties, that's a hard, man, that's a hard time. You, just, you have no idea what adult looks like and it's slapping you in the face real quick, you know, and, and doing it. And so that's, that, that hasn't changed. Like that was the same when I was in my twenties, the same when my parents were in their twenties and it, well, maybe before that it was when they were like 15 or right. 13, right? right. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, but but uh, thank you for for your you know your fatherhood and just yeah. accepting that call yeah. and loving your children well. Um, yeah. Sounds like you did a good job. Uh, we'll ask them <laughs> yeah. when I get the courage. I'll ask them. Whenever they have kids, I'll, you I'll, can I'll see. Send them a, I'll send them. A, I'll send them a form. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> that's probably that's not so a good great. idea. <laughs> you make, make sure you catch them on the right day. Questions, <laughs> comments, concerns. Yeah, yeah. concerns yeah. And, and at the end, by the way, it's too late, so it's not going to change. It's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Uh, Thank you. This was fun. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And and I don't know what anybody else would get out of this. I know I got a lot of. I, I did yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, David. Yeah. Thanks. All right. See y'all. Bye bye. <laughs>